Good morning, Master Class. It's November 13th and introduce you to Hannah Nally, my daughter, Robin's daughter. And she lives in Dallas and went to school under Susan and other people here. So I just had a nice homecoming. It's good to see everybody. And we are starting very late as everybody knows because uh, we honored the veterans in a special way this morning, which I'm always happy to have. It always makes me tear up. My father was a vet, so I'm, I'm especially inclined to like that that service. Uh, we have prayers of thanksgiving and, and asking for health with Sharon and Cherry of our uh, group. Robin just asked for prayers for her health. Is that? And then for a couple of weeks, and then... Uh, um, Kathy Courtright had her operation this week and it went well. So, so I'm going to pray for that. Lord, we, we do thank you for the successful operation of Kathy and ask that you would help her recover quickly and completely, give her family uh, the energy and the wisdom to support her in every way. Uh, for Sharon Cherry, we ask that you would uh, relieve her health issues. Uh, we are asked that your complete healing step into this matter and that you would uh, bring her back to us whole and complete in short order. In Jesus name. Amen. Good night, Dan. Oh, about Sharon. Uh, she had a transplant, a kidney transplant two years ago. Oh, I didn't know. Okay. But um, she also has Crohn's and now the Crohn's is acting up and her kidney is in danger. Oh, okay. And, um, if she loses this kidney, then she feels like that. She, you know, she'll lose her life. So, wow, it, it is very serious. Okay, thank you for that. We'll, so, we'll all that. She does need my prayers. Okay. Uh, uh, do you have our Zoom number by any chance, so I can? Do you have Do you have the Zoom number? Yeah, court rights are looking for it. Hang on, Don. We'll start just a minute. Yeah, I should have it right here too. It auto saves on your yeah, so but I'm I'm in the middle of class and I can't get to it. No, I have it. I can pull up the right email. Uh, I'll get it. Text it to her. Okay. Uh, text, do you have marks? Yeah, I've got both of them. I'll okay. find it. Okay. Thank you. Um, so thank you for telling us that about Sharon. We'll pray extra hard for that. Um, so... I've been reading a book that has completely blown my mind about the image of God and why I haven't been able to love God more. And I want to share that with everybody in a few weeks. So does anybody have a preference over December 4th or 11th to hear a important <coughs> message? Fourth. The 4th, you'd rather have the 4th? We've got grandkids doing a program on the 11th. All right. <laughs> anybody care one way or the other? All right, on December 4th, we'll have a lesson that I'm, I'll share with you things that have just been keeping me awake uh, and changing my whole view. And I, I thought just this morning when Mitch uh, gave his sermon, as you know, he and I don't normally coordinate, but one of the first things he said at his first point was, if you don't know Jesus, and then he went from there. I don't know what he said after that, because that's part of what I want to talk about is I don't think I have known Jesus in the way that he wants me to know him. And it's not, not from lack of trying, and it's not from reading the Bible, and it's not from going to church. I had, I think I have missed something really, really important. And I was given a book this last week that I'll share the title of it uh, at a later point with you that has really opened my eyes. And I think I have a much more biblical view, which is important but a, a much better view that's going to allow me to love God and love Jesus much better than I ever have in the past. So I'm, I'm looking forward to sharing with you. It may be the most important lesson that I ever teach. I really feel that way. 
So uh, December 4th, uh, if you can make it or check in on Zoom, I, I think you'll find it very interesting. Um, the, um, anyway, I'll stop there and we'll, we'll, we'll move on for this morning's lesson. So this morning's lesson is uh, on, from the One Hit Wonder series and it's about the woman caught in adultery. And I hope some of you got to watch the video. And I'm curious, did anybody have any thoughts about the video that struck you? It's, it's one of the fun things about the One Hit Wonder series is we take little pieces of character, a few verses out of the Bible, and then be able to build a story around it that fits the culture and the time. So a lot of the story is obviously not straight out of the Bible, but it's meant to fit with the Bible. So was there anything about the video that you liked or didn't like, especially your thought didn't come, wasn't especially biblical. Anything hit any anybody? No? I had a real hard time liking this character. Because <laughs> of her, uh, the attitude of, it was the one phrase where she said, you know, you know, you can be stoned for adultery and my village is just mean enough to do it. And I thought, they're your consequences. You made the choice. Yeah. See? <laughs> yeah. 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 But, but, on the other way, the man didn't have a consequence. Right. And he, when God said, don't you know, commit adultery, he didn't say women don't commit adultery. He wanted both. So right. that is where the and, Good. That it's a big discrepancy, and we will, and that that's why it was that's why it was designed for the man to be obviously escaped from that. Oh yeah, yeah. but yeah, but that's always been a point. But how, how did he get out of there? But. Yeah. I guess so I'm, by the way, court rights, we're glad to have you and Kathy. We're thrilled that your operation went well. We we prayed for you just a few minutes ago. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. And I didn't think that in her hometown she was necessarily doing anything uh, like she did in Jerusalem. Right. That she was just an odd duck or different than everybody else and didn't associate well with the rest of them. It wasn't anything to her. Yeah. And there was a couple things that were interesting. We wanted, uh, there was a point made earlier that Jesus was a judge of the world. And then at the end, and, and I, I would have sworn I heard him say, uh, but he was not going to judge. But the fact that he didn't condemn her. Uh, kind of gave me the impression that although he's the judge of the world, he wasn't judging necessarily. Yeah. Okay. So we'll talk about the judging aspect of that in just a little bit. Good. Can and, one note? Can we get the one hit wonders on the YouTube uh, channel? <laughs> the our classes, you mean? Or no, the yeah, the, you should be able to. I are they not there? Find that one. Okay. Will you send me an email and I'll make sure okay. Meredith puts it up? She may not have put it up. Um, okay. You gotta go to the website. Okay. Then I'll, I'll Jesus have. Jesus write in the sand. Yeah. What did Jesus write in the sand? Yeah. 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 That's cool. Lots of speculations on that over yeah. the years. Yeah. Okay. We'll talk about that too. I think it clarified <clears throat> adultery better than, I mean, it, it brought to me a clarification. Okay. Of being up for people. That have had some problems of remarrying. That <clears throat> I had missed. Okay, we'll talk about that too. Then good. I can. Uh, I had missed it, and I I could bring forward experiences to fit various parts of. It. Okay, so we'll we'll do that. We and I, I was thoughtful when I did this of our former president Jimmy Carter, who made it clear to the nation that he had not committed adultery physically, but he had in his own heart. What a hubbub that that brought out! And one more. Uh, I found it interesting that the the Pharisees had the intestinal fortitude to totally 
disregard any humanity for this woman and bring her before Jesus. Now, she did wrong, but the fact that they made a huge, well, seemingly huge public spectacle of this, they did it right there in the temple, people were around, just heartless. Yeah, they, it, it wasn't about her. That was it, it. Was it wasn't about her, right? Well, and yeah. and so they and that's part her. of what I get it, right? But I mean, they used her as a prop. And so. good, yeah. That's part of why Jesus gets pretty angry. Yeah. All right. So let's let's first start with uh, go to an odd, odd place to start this. We're going to go to John twenty thirty. So, um, John twenty thirty, and then John twenty thirty is the next to the last chapter in John, and it says Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may uh, have life in his name. Perfect ending to the book of John, if you read that. That's like, this book's over, right? But it's not over. That's, cha that's chapter 20. We got chapter 21. And so all of a sudden, we now pick up in chapter 21. Mo one of the most important stories in John is the, the miraculous catch of the fish and, and Peter being reinstated by John. So we get all the way to the end of that story. And now we get to verse 25. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that not e that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. Another perfect ending to the book of John, and it does end there, right? So what you have, you remember John, when we talked about it a couple of years ago, John was probably written as the last, one of the last books in the Bible, long after the other gospels had been written. It's probably written in, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, really late. John's, John's an older man, and he's recollecting what, what had happened many years ago, right? So he's not writing his gospel like the other gospel accounts. That's why John looks entirely different. He doesn't need to replicate Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So he gives a whole different set of stories. And, and so you see at the end of John, it's as if he's written it. And then he goes, oh, I've got one more story I really want to tell you guys. And he even tells you, I've got a lot more to tell you, but I can't write it down. That's just too much to write down. So it's not, it's not odd that you would say there are other stories about Jesus that John knew and other people knew that could have gone in the book of John. So I bring that up because should this story of the adulterous woman, which is in John 7, 53 to 8, 11. If you go to John 7, 53, I don't know what version you particularly, particularly have, but most uh, books have something that separates from this passage out. And I'm, I'm trying to get to it in. In the uh, New International, whoop, look at the UK version. I don't want to look at the UK version. In the um, American version, it has a bracket over these verses says, the earliest manuscripts and many other ancient witnesses do not have John 53 to 8, 11. A few manuscripts include these verses wholly or in part, and then has them placed in different parts of the Bible. So what there's, what in, in plain language, if you go back to the earliest manuscripts we have, which are, by the way, are not very early, there are hundreds of years after the time of Jesus, we do not have any of the original manuscripts of John. Don't have those originals. We have copies of copies, right? So we don't really have a copy of the original manuscript to John to say, okay, this is what the book of John should look like. And it appears that the earliest, uh, the first time that it's really kind of accepted is by Jerome. And Jerome is um, 
when he's writing the Vulgate. So the Vulgate was when the church decided we need a translation, not in the Greek, because fewer and fewer people were reading Greek. We need one in Latin because the Romans still ruled the world. And so they wanted a version in Latin. So that was the Vulgate version. Jerome did that in the late 300s. Jerome, the leader of Jerome was one of the church scholars. And so he's well known. So when Jerome translates the Vulgate, he puts this in it. And his, his logic was, it's in several of the things I've read. People commonly accept it. I'm going to put it in. That becomes the official version for the Catholic Church, which is the only church that exists for the next 1400 years or 1100 years or so. So it, that is why it's accepted, because it ends up being in the Vulgate. When you read all the stuff, and you can read pages and pages and pages about this, I think the general conclusion is that this is probably an early gospel type story that people accepted as being the words of Jesus that actually happened. And it and somehow it gets inserted into the original manuscript of John. So it's it's probably reliable. One of the stories that John talks about that he didn't include, but it gets included. Did John write it and insert it? Did somebody write it and insert it along the way? I don't know. Most, most scholars would say today it was not in the original manuscript of John, but it is a reliable piece of scripture to use. And that this is not the only one that's like this in the Bible, but it's just one of the main ones. The end of Mark is also part of it. Yeah. I've been waiting a week to ask you this question. Okay. But you can answer it after class. It's pretty too long. Okay. Why, why did they wait so long? The reason I, the reason I ask you, because I listen to something at night, that people look back and say, well, gosh, after so many years, things be misinterpreted or you forget certain things. Or but why did they wait so long to write the Gospels and things like that? Because it just leaves, it leaves open for scrutiny that, well, gosh, after 40, 50, 60 years. Yeah. Can you be able to answer this question? I might not hear. Um, okay, so the first Gospels are not written until probably in the 60s. But there were other things written before that that people used. We know uh, there, there's, a, there's a um, commonly thought that there was a several pieces of literature, one main piece of literature that's called Q that is the common source that Luke and Matthew used. So there were probably other writings at the time that we no longer have use, mm -hmm. use of. So they didn't feel a need because people were very used to transmitting things orally. Mm -hmm. So they, they were not like we are today. We want, now we're like, I want the original manuscript, I want word for word, da, 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 or it's not valid. In their world, but valid meant, is it true? not is it word for word precise so their world they didn't have any problem with it if they had a problem they'd have already written it down and so it's not only that but but so you have the different christian writings that we've talked about probably james was the first one written in the late 40s there were almost all the rest of it was written from in the 50s and 60s and then john's books were written probably in the 80s i think but even so, they're written and they're passed around to all the churches, but they're not really put into final form and accepted by the churches and the church leaders mm -hmm. until in the late 100s and okay. maybe even 200s. So that's so you can see even as late as then, <laughs> but you don't have any body that says this is right and this is wrong until the church councils start getting put together. And, even they go, well, that's the book of John. But it's not until years later that they finally conclude this is the book of John. But, but that's for, I'm, I'm talking about the New Testament in this case. Um, so that if you look at the verses that are, that are under question, it's a very tiny number. Like I said, this passage, the end of Mark, there's, there's, two or three places. Other than that, almost everybody accepts that we have a very good 
understanding of what the original manuscripts were meant to say. And any of the differences are minute and not important. For instance, if you left this out, you left the book of Mark, the end of Mark out, are you, are you worse off? No, you're not worse off, but it's better to have them. I think they're more. Old Testament is a different deal. Old Testament was the Jews had pretty well gotten to what they accepted as their, their final scripts. Mm -hmm. And it was translated into the Septuagint in the 300 BCs. And that's what everybody used back then was the Greek version of the Old Testament, the, except for the Jews. They still use the Hebrew. Everybody else used the Greek. So we have, that's, that's how we get it. And, but, but it's also, we can't pretend like there weren't a lot of other things written. There were a lot of things. We see some of them as the books called the Apocrypha that are in the Catholic Bible and some other Christian organizations. So there were a lot of other things written. It's just what we have in our Bible today is what the early churches and church leaders agreed through the Holy Spirit. These are scripture. So I, th I think for as for purposes of especially today, is this lesson reliable scripture? I believe yes. Was it in the early man in the first manuscript of John? I don't know. But it does, I, I believe it's reliable scripture. It fits. There's nothing about it that doesn't fit the rest of the uh, Bible. And it's been used by churches for thousands of years. And so I think it's it's useful for that. Um, anyway, that's that's the background of, of that. So let's let's look at the, the story, which is in John 753, where it starts. And you, so this follows when Nicodemus and the others are, uh, the Jewish leaders are from seven, uh, they're trying to decide what to do with Jesus because he's causing them havoc and they don't like it. Nicodemus, this is one of the other times when Nicodemus is talked about in the Bible, one of three times uh, where he had gone to, they admit he'd gone to Jesus earlier and who was one of their own number. So by this time, Nicodemus has become a disciple of Jesus. Does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he has been doing? They don't answer that question. He obviously is asking a question that the answer is no, we don't, but they are gonna do it anyway. So they're breaking the law to start with. Uh, and they their answer is, are you from Galilee too? Look into it and you'll find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. We don't really have a backup for that, but apparently that was a strong enough argument that it won the day. Uh, then whoever decided to split things up into chapters, put a chapter mark here. The chapters were not in the original manuscript. The chapters are added much, much, much later. So the break that we see from what we call 811 into chapter eight uh, wasn't in the original manuscript. Uh, or even late manuscripts. Then they all went home. So now Jesus was at uh, arguing with the Pharisees. Then they go home. And then this goes, uh, the story goes in verse 8, 1. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. So back to the diagram of the temple that we had last week. Jesus is in the temple courts, probably in the court of the women, in the temple grounds, right? So anybody could hear him teach, uh, including women. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. Now, this is going to reference Deuteronomy 22.22. 22. And part of what we're going to see is what Robin talked a minute ago, but some other, other verses come into play. First of all, if the woman's caught, caught in adultery, either something's really weird or they also caught the man in adultery, right? So, they're, so they didn't bring the man, which is them breaking the law. And then also they didn't bring any witnesses. So the, by, by both of those two things, they are themselves breaking the commandments of Moses when they brought this. That's not their point. They're, they're, they don't really care about that. 
they're trying to they're trying to put Jesus in a position that he's either going to obviously break the laws of Moses or the Roman law, one of the two. Why why is that? Because if if he says don't stone her, then he's breaking the laws. He's not respecting the laws of Moses. He says to stone her, he's breaking the Roman law because the Jews don't have the right to stone her. So he would be instigating a you know an action by the Jews that was against the Roman law. So they think they have Jesus totally trapped. And when when that gets there. And clearly as as Kit said, they don't care about the woman. They are being self-righteous. It's worse than Harper Valley PTA. So the uh, they bring her caught in adultery. Then they made her stand before the group. I mean, they are they are making sure this woman is humiliated, is clear. There's no argument that she was caught in adultery, uh, supposedly. Uh, and then and said to Jesus, teacher, probably a sarcastic teacher, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. Now, how do you catch someone in the act of adultery? That's that's not easy to do, right? So there's the video showed one setup, but just think about it. They probably had something that they were trapping her on purpose. Something was setting this up so they could get this done. Or they just had an opportunity that a rare opportunity. It's hard to catch people in the act of adultery, but apparently they do. In, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Not, and again, it's not women. It's both every it's both parties who are caught in adultery are to be stoned. Now, what do you say? And then the parenthetical here is they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. Again, accusing either against the Romans or the Jews. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. So you can, I don't know if you you know, spend much time in old towns, but I remember when I grew up, uh, my parents had grown up in, or part, spent part of their time in the little town of Hastings, Oklahoma. And in Hastings, Oklahoma, the men would sit on the corners and chew tobacco, smoke tobacco, and talk and waste their whole day because they'd farm in the morning and farm at night. But in the middle of the day, they'd just sit and talk. And my grandparents owned the general store, so that was always in front of their general store. And I can remember watching them, they could sit on their heels. They didn't have a bench that they sat on. They'd just sit on their heels. Now, I can't do that. I haven't been able to do that since I was 20, probably. Mm -hmm. But the, I can just see Jesus. He's He's been sitting there in the temple. And I, I envision him just bending, either bending over or sitting on his heels mm -hmm. and just writing. Now, we had a sermon on the finger of God a few months ago, or a few weeks ago. So anybody remember hearing that sermon on the finger of God? And then we talked about it a little bit. Then I wrote an eyewitness that you're going to hear in four or five months, you're going to get to see an eyewitness video on the finger of God. Finger of God is what Jesus used, because Jesus is God on earth. Remember what Mitch's conclusion was on the finger of God. This was... This is one of the one, one of Mitch's most brilliant correlations that he's ever come up with. Susan? That's something to do with the Spirit of God. Something to do with the Spirit of God. Yeah. Because he he had uh, he related the finger of God in one of the versions of the gospel. It talks, if I write by the finger of God, he's talking about that. And then in the other version, it says the spirit of God instead of finger of God. So by then Mitch ends up with the idea that when you're using the finger of God, you're using the spirit of God, or you are talking about the Holy Spirit. So that, I now relate this to, to Jesus. When he's writing, this is not Jesus with his finger. This is the Holy Spirit's writing in the, in the dust. It's amazing. This is the only time we have anything that Jesus wrote that in in anywhere and if we don't get to know what it is we don't know what it is it's not permanent it's gone forever but jesus just as jesus didn't baptize people jesus didn't write anything down other people wrote his stuff for him 
And I can just see Jesus and all these people, they can't wait to hear what he's what he's going to come up with. And you know, they're waiting on the edge of the seat. He, and clearly he's they think they've got him trapped. But Jesus bent down and started right on the ground with his finger. And and he doesn't say anything. When they kept questioning him, so apparently he's just and he's he's not ignoring them. He's just writing in the ground. He's not answering their questions. He's been quiet. This is the pre prelude to when he doesn't say anything in front of the when his crucifixion comes up later. He's just writing in the ground. And and can't you imagine the tension that's building? It's, I mean, this has got to be great, and the crowd has got to be loving it. And they're you know you, they're standing on their tippy toes. Trying, what is that guy writing in the ground? But they keep questioning. He straightens up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Okay, So he's not saying not to stone her. He's actually saying stone her. Just the first one's got to be without sin. So he is he is. He is not going against the laws of Moses when he gives that answer. And he's not going against the Roman law, right? And 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 so now they are obviously in a big problem because they know none of them are without sin. See, right? I had never, I guess, thought in those terms that the Pharisees acknowledged they were sinners. I guess I thought they thought by following. Yeah. you know, all their uh, regulations that, that they can get. Right. So the, the, that's, that's a good point. So up to this time, mm -hmm. the Pharisees are portraying themselves as we follow the law, therefore we are righteous. I would, I would say not necessarily without sin, but they are, they are the most righteous of all people because they do the best job of following the law. And that's what they portrayed everybody. Now they're in a box, right? Because if they don't stone her, they're breaking the laws of Moses. Because they have acknowledged that the laws of Moses say we have to stone her. And they know they can't stone her because of the Roman laws. And also because Jews, Jews, Jesus has put them in this trap of saying, the first one that throws the stone is, is saying to the crowd, I'm without sin. So he has completely turned the tables on him with this answer, right? And he hasn't, he hasn't acknowledged, doesn't have to acknowledge whether she's guilty or not. He actually is kind of acknowledging she's guilty because by the way, he, he's accepting she's guilty of, of the charge. At, at, this, at this, those who heard began going away one at a time. Now, I don't know how many there were, but let's say 40, 50. You know, it's a pretty big crowd, bigger than the crowd we have today. And this is the greatest, greatest little insert. The oldest ones first, and then following, then the youngest, obviously, would go last. The oldest ones first. Isn't that a great idea that the oldest ones get it? They're wise enough to go. We are losing and we are getting out of here as soon as we can because we understand that. And then the young ones are going, oh, and then they pick up and leave until only Jesus was left with the woman standing, still standing there. What, a, what an interesting, you still got the crowd. Crowds, they're there. It's just the Pharisees and the leaders have left. Jesus straightened up again and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? Right? They can't condemn her because it takes two witnesses to actually condemn her. So the answer is clearly they didn't and they're gone. No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Now, the idea of judgment, we'll talk about in a minute. So, he doesn't have to judge her. She's clearly guilty. 
Right. Everybody has accepted that she's guilty of adultery, but he's not condemning her to death. And so she is, she gets to be relieved from that. And then he declares, go now and leave your life of sin. And, and in other versions, it says that sin no more or something to that effect. We don't know what, what happens to her. We know nothing about this woman from that point forward. But what we do know is Jesus hates sin. He's, he's much more worried about her staying in her life of sinful ways than whether she's going to die from that. He would much rather she chooses to repent and turn from her sin. That is the essence of his teaching all the time. Because whatever you're doing to sin, quit it. Don't make excuses. Just stop and quit sinning. And um, that's what some of the other versions say, which I really like it that way. It's just like, quit sinning. Like, don't give me any more excuses. Don't do your ways. And I think, um, as we will see when we do this lesson coming up on the fourth, that's really the answer almost all the time is, you probably are, if you're living in a life of sin, you basically are worshiping a different God. You are worshiping yourself. You're worshiping your desires. You're worshiping what the world values, whatever. What he's telling her is much more basic than just quit misbehaving. Mm -hmm. It's quit having this life where you treasure these gods of the flesh and of the world. And and we don't often get that. We, you know, when I've heard this all my life, I'm like, okay, I'm not going to ever commit adultery or I'm not going to murder somebody. I've got these, you know, this list of 12, 20 things. Like, okay, I'm not going to do those things. That's not the point. The point is, if you if you don't have these other gods, you're not going to do those sorts of things. Right? So he's he's telling you that. And so whenever <coughs> I, I think about today's world and my friends and how they view Christianity and how I viewed it often. When I view Christianity that way, I don't really have an answer to the world that says, well, you did this, you sin. And God tells us to love everybody. So you have to accept whatever I'm doing. So it's this is one of those places where you can where it all comes together to me is I've got to love you. No problem with that. But I can't, I can't have any other thing that I've got to quit sinning and you've got to quit sinning. And that's, that's gotta be always my position is, and it's not mine to judge. It's, it's just, but whatever it is, whatever this, whatever the question is, the answer is always quit sinning. And so that's, that's the position, I think, why this story is so powerful to us, is that it gives us an answer to lots of situations where we don't agree with what's going on necessarily, where we're, we're placed in bad positions. But the answer is always, quit sinning. Always what? Quit sinning. Just, uh, just leave your life of sin. And more... And that, that's why I like this version. So I'm, I'm going to read out the New International and then I'm going to wrap it up. <clears throat> Leave your, and I'm, I'm going to actually translate this slightly different. Leave your lifestyle of sin. Don't, don't worry about, is this little thing I did, is that a sin? I mean, I used to do that. I used to have a scorecard, like sin, then sin. It's like, he's not talking about that. It's like, leave your lifestyle of sin. Have a lifestyle where you, where you worship God and you follow him only. Now I'm way over time. Thank you guys for your patience. And we will pick this up. Do not miss December 4th. See you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, Court Rights. Thanks, Mr. Don. Thank you, Phil. Any news from your side, Mark? The all, going, all going according to plan. Great. Glad to hear it. Keep praying for us. We appreciate it very much. We'll, Thank you. We'll, con we'll continue to do so. Thank you.